Hi there, I am Carrie Ann Barrett, and I'm super excited tonight to share with you a guest and her story. As you know, I'm here to help people share their stories for God's glory. I'm a wife, mom, and counselor, and an author of Put Your Crown On. You can also on Amazon, if you use my name as a search, find four different kinds of journals. There's a dream journal, a prayer journal, an envision journal, and a journey journal that can help you process your walk with the Lord. But tonight, I have a new friend. Virginia Killingsworth, and she is a, such a sweet treasure, and you're really going to enjoy her story tonight. In fact, her many stories. She is a prophetic worship leader and an author. I am excited for her to share her book with you. Her name is Virginia Killingsworth. Virginia, welcome. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks, Carrie. It's so good to be here with you. Great. Thanks for coming on here. I would love for you to share a little bit about who you are and what you do for ministry and so forth. Okay. Well, currently I live in Jacksonville, Florida with my husband, Sean, and we uh, steward a little body of believers called All Things Restored. And we're just going for the more together. You know, when we gather, we try to just give everybody, uh, everybody's peace is important. And so we try to have a free flowing uh, spirit led gathering rather than just, you know, the the script or whatever and so it's been challenging it's been wonderful you know we're a body of believers that we're learning how to live out of heaven into the earth so um it's just a lot of fun so i i i'm one of the worship leaders there i've led worship for many years and um i just uh two years ago wrote my first book that was so fun yeah and can you talk a little bit about that sure it's called miracles are normal co-creating through oneness with god and so really, um, you know, I, you're probably the same way, Carrie, but you know, when I teach something or when I write something, it, it really has to be something that's really resonating in me at the time. And so a lot of times what I'm, what I'm releasing is just the classroom that I'm in, or, you know, just that stuff that we're just working out in our own, in our own life. So really this, this whole book was really answers to questions that I have before the Lord when he took me into heavenly council chambers. And he, you know, I learned that he really does like our questions. <laughs> you know, I, I kind of grew up in a, in a church that, you know, you don't question God, you know, and I learned it's, you know, he really does like that. And he come let us reason together. He's wanting us to do that. He wants us to bring our questions to him. He puts them in us with the goal of him answering them. So a lot of the, really the, the, that whole book is just an answer to some questions I had because, um, and, and I'm sure you've seen this and experienced this as well. You know, we, those of us that are really pressing into hearing for the, from the Lord and, you know, we've probably heard, gotten words from the Lord uh, gotten prophetic words, you know, from him and through other people. And some of those we might have seen manifest and others not yet. And so, um, I think I'm not the only one that has some unanswered questions in that area. Absolutely. And, yes. And, and so I learned, you know, we do prophesy in part, right? We know in part we prophesy in part. I also learned why the Lord says, don't despise prophecy, because if you don't understand what's going on, you can become offended you know, why didn't this happen? And, and so really the Lord really took me into the heavenly realm and showed me the creative process that he used in the beginning. Wow. I'm going to stop you right there. I okay. want you to clarify what that means when somebody is listening and they hear you went into the heavenly realm. What, what does that mean? Great question. So, you know, we know the verse, but I don't think we really understand the practical outworking. If I said this verse, probably everybody listening would be like, yeah, I know that I've heard that, but it's Ephesians 3.20. We're seated with Christ in heavenly places. But what does that really mean? And what is the practical outworking of that? And what the Lord showed me is, you know, we're three-part beings, right? We're created in the image of God. So he's father, son, and Holy Spirit. We're spirit, soul, and body. And there's a part of us that corresponds to a part of him. Now, this is a gross oversimplification of an infinite God, of course, but um, just for, in, you know, for this classroom, um, when we're born again, when we're born from above, right, our spirits before salvation were dead in sin, the Bible says, and we were made alive in Christ. And at that moment, our, our made alive in Christ spirit is seated with him in the heavenly realm. We're multidimensional beings just like he is. Yeah. 
And so, um, and this isn't that counterfeit new age, your gods thing. It's, it's, that's the counterfeit right. of the real that we don't really even understand what it means to be created in the image of God. We're not even scratching the surface of everything that Adam lost and everything that Christ gave us back. So living out of the heavenly realm, you know, our spirits are already there. We're seated in Christ in heavenly places. But sometimes we don't experience that because we haven't learned to turn our attention to it. So our spirits are in heaven. Our souls, I mean, our bodies obviously are here. We see, we see our earth suits sitting before us. And so we function as gates of heaven in, into the earth. That's what Psalm 24 is talking about. You know, lift up your head so you gates. So the king of glory will come in. And the, yes, there are gates in the earth, gates in the heavenly realm, gates in the human body, but we are gates. And so being able to experience heavenly reality is as simple as turning our attention to what the word says we know is true. Mm -hmm. And we can, we tap into it through the gate of our sanctified imagination. And we step in and we begin to get glimpses of what our spirit's already doing in the heavenly realm. Why would we want to do that? Well, when we turn our attention to it, then we can eat the fruit of it here in this realm. Oh, and then heaven like? can flow through us into the earth. Yeah. What does that look like, Virginia? I'll, I'll tell you one of the early experiences that I had that, you know, you know how when the Lord will share something that's kind of new territory for you and you know, it's true, but you don't really know, <laughs> you know, it's like, you know it because he said it and he's confirmed it in the word, but it's like, yes, yeah, it's real kind of thing. You know, I was in that phase because this was so new to me. And um, one day I sat down, you know, just to, to pray and to spend time with the Lord. And all of a sudden I just felt prompted in my, well, I would sit down for, you know, when, when the Lord was first introduced introducing me to this. And just as a way to help, help me grasp it, I would say, um, you know, Lord, I'm wrapping my, uh, spirit around my body and I'm going into the heavenly realm. Well, I wasn't really going, I was just turning my attention to it, but that helped me to have an understanding of a practical, tangible anchor for what was happening. So I would just sit down and I would spend time with the Lord and whatever, um, my imagination, wherever he would take me through that gateway, I would just go. Now, I do want to say this. I believe that using the imagination as a gate is something that the body of Christ has not really understood very well. And I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about that. And, you know, my my early encounters and yours might have been the same. A lot of them were sovereignly initiated. You know, he and I didn't understand that once he establishes that pathway, I can choose to go back. And I do that through the gate of my imagination. You know, I was kind of just waiting for me to waiting for him to hit me in the head with it again, you yeah. know? And um, so I began, he began to teach me that, you know, he created our imagination. He gave it to us for a purpose. And it's in the word when the Bible talks about the eye in Ephesians, it talks about the eyes of your heart being enlightened. If you look that up, it literally means your imagination. If you look up those words, how do we use that? Like a lot of people right now are probably going, I don't know, like that can imagine pretty crazy things. So how do you know? Well, the gate, and then I have a whole chapter in this, in my book, because it's so important and so misunderstood in the body of Christ. Uh, I have a whole, a whole chapter on the imagination, but that gate has to be opened. Some of us that was really squashed, just, you know, religion's really good at that or authoritarian control or just abuse, right? You shut down your imagination sometimes just to survive. Um, and so that gate has to be opened, but it also has to be cleansed. Uh, you know, vain imagination. So sometimes you conversely, uh, you know, sometimes if we're abused in childhood, everything's just shuts down. We go numb. Some people though, they use that gate as an escape from reality, right? They, they, you know, I'm not really here. This isn't really happening. And so, you know, it's, I believe there's grace. God has so much grace to cover. We do what we have to do to survive until he can pull us out and heal us and teach us better. But the side effects of that are where we are trading with a lying spirit. And so that, that vain imagination can defile that gate. And after we come to the Lord in order for that to really be properly used to access the heavenly realm, it has to be cleansed. And yeah. so we just, you know, we cleanse it by the blood of the lamb and by choosing truth, by moving through difficult things instead of escaping from them. 
Yeah. You know, by embracing the word of the Lord, even if it's hard, you know, not making the word say what we want it to say, but humbling ourselves and being teachable and being quick to repent, not not getting caught in condemnation, but understanding we can run boldly when he when he corrects us. And all of those things help to cleanse the imagination gate so that and also I think another important thing is having a really solid foundation in the word because it's the it's what's in our imagination what you know what's in us is what our imagination has to draw on if it's if it's a lot of untruth or pornography or lust or you know occultic things then that you know that's what our imagination is going to draw from but it really should be drawing from the from the logos word of god it should yes. be drawing from the written word of god which is our plumb line Absolutely. I think, you know, we can come to wherever we are with a lot of uh, not great imagination. Like I was talking to my daughter about, or I don't know if it was my daughter, but I was talking about having seen Jaws when I was a kid. So uh, a lot of times my imagination would go into, there's a shark in the water. You know, our imagination can be not useful uh, and helpful, but our imagination was meant, as you're saying, to be useful and to be used by God. Absolutely. What's a gate? Yeah. So whoever occupies, whoever, whatever is occupying that gate will determine what flows through that gate. Yeah. So it's, it's just, it's a gate. That's all. And so, um, as I, you know, as, as I've just submitted to that process of growth and mature, ma you know, maturation and cleansing and dealing with dealing with our junk, right. We have to deal, deal with our junk as we grow up in the Lord. And as, as we continue to say yes and, and keep that yes in our heart and submit to that process, then it becomes easier and easier to engage the heavenly realm with the imagination. And, you know, always we test it by the word and, and we, you know, we allow, we allow that those words to be tested. And we asked the, the father to do that. So, you know, when, in the early days I was sitting down and I would just go where my imagination would take me. And it would, I would, he would always show me where it was in the word. And so this in particular instance that I was going to share with you, what this looked like, he started taking me to the river of life. Now we know that's, that's in the Bible, right? But I would see myself drinking from the river of life. And, um, you know, I would swim in it and, you know, in the spirit realm, you can do things you can't do here. So I was breathing in the water, you know, and having a lot of fun, but just drinking, drinking, drinking. And then, but then what happened is I saw my spirit. I knew I was, I knew my soul was watching my spirit, man, drink the water in, in, in another dimension, in the heavenly dimension. But I saw that water hit this dam in my soul and I, I just saw it with in, you know, in my mind's eye, in my imagination. And I didn't know what to do. And I just kind of was like, wow, that was, you know, is that the end of that? And I inquired of the Lord. I didn't hear anything. So I forget how many days every day I would sit down with the Lord and the same thing would happen. And finally, after maybe four or five days, he dropped that scripture in my, in my spirit from Zechariah, where he was saying grace, grace to the mountain. So I opened my Bible and I read it out loud. The minute I read that out loud, I saw that dam in my soul break. I'd been through a, just, I'd been through a really, really hard, hard season, a lot of loss and a lot of just really traumatic things. And I know that was part of that dam, you know, the, the beliefs and the unhealed wounds and all that stuff. And so the minute I read that scripture, I saw that water burst through. And the cool thing about this encounter, it was the Lord was teaching me how real this is because, you know, because I had been in just such a dry, difficult place, I had not been writing songs for a really long time. It was just, I'd sit down at the keyboard and it was just, you know, it was, I was not in a good place to create. And right after this encounter, I went to the keyboard and it just, it just started flowing. I wrote five songs in two days. Wow. That's and, nice. Yes. And so that was the Lord just in a really elementary encounter. Just, he just took a snapshot from the river of life that's in the book of revelation and showed me that I was there and could be there. But he showed me and taught me how real that was because that encounter that, that happened in the invisible heavenly spiritual realm manifested tangibly in the earth realm. Wow. And I've seen that. So, I mean, that was one of my earliest encounters. I've seen it so many times with myself and so many other people. That realm is more real than this one. I mean, the Bible says that it says that's, that's eternal. This is temporal. And, and, um, 
in Hebrews, it talks about this realm is really made out of that realm. You know, it's, it's, and so those things are more real than this, but we fell into limitation. We were flipped wrong side up and we think this is more real. Because it feels real, right? We can touch and smell mm -hmm. this place. Yeah. So we're being acclimated. We're, we're returning to our first estate. We're starting to tap into what Jesus has restored for us, that Adam walked in effortlessly. And we're starting to understand that there's so much more. Yeah. Tell, tell me about, tell us about the more, the miracles that are in your book that you've experienced or seen. Well, the the premise of the book, like I said, came out of my questions like, Lord, you know, I know, I know you're the God of miracles. I know you keep your promises. I know if there's a problem, it's not on your end. It's got to be here. But what is it? You know, teach me. Mm -hmm. And he loved, he loved that. And so really to put a, a long book in a nutshell, he started teaching me, first of all, about the dance of the two camps, right? What's his part and what's our part? right? We're more powerful than we realize, but we can't do anything in our flesh. It all comes out of that place of humble dependence upon him and our oneness with him. And then he began to teach me about maturation and miracles, how God does more for a baby than he does for a son that he's trying to grow to maturity and how sometimes, um, things that we experienced in when we first came to the Lord, that was so easy. And it's like, what happened? Am I backslidden? And it's no, he said to me one time, he said, no, I'm not abandoning you. He said, I'm stepping back so you can grow into the fullness of our oneness. Mm -hmm. So part of the answer to those questions was understanding, okay, I'm feeling abandoned by God right now, but that's not who he is. So what's happening? Well, it's that he's letting me grow up. You know, he'll do for, you know, a parent will do for a two-year-old what would be inappropriate to do for your 20-year-old. And so it's the same with us. He's sometimes we're reluctant to grow because we, you know, sometimes we like it to be quick and easy, right? I do. <laughs> and I so, do. Yeah, we don't like to work our spiritual muscles. And he showed me in First John 2, when John said, I write to you little children because your sins are forgiven. And, you know, I write to you young men because you're strong and the word of God abides within you. You've overcome the adversary, your personal adversary. And I write to you, Father, because you know the one who's from the beginning. And that's what I call our maturity map. And it shows what happens in each of those phases. So a lot of us are in our young man phase and we're having to work our spiritual muscles, but because we don't understand that that's what's happening, we think God's holding back something from us or we're failing or something like that when we just don't understand the objective of our classroom. Yeah. And then he broke down the creative process that we see in Genesis. You know, when Elohim created together in the beginning, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he showed me that the, our thoughts correspond to the father, our emotions correspond to Holy Spirit and our words. We know, of course, you know, we know Yeshua, Jesus is the word. So our words, as well as our physical body, because he was the word made flesh, correspond to him. So because he was in one accord, he was in full agreement with himself. He created effortlessly in the beginning. So the creative pattern still works for whoever will follow it. So when we're in alignment, when our thoughts are in alignment with him, when our emotions are in alignment with him, when our words and our actions are in alignment with him and with ourself, that's the hard part. Then miracles manifest because it, it, they're not, they're normal. Because right, they are. Yeah. They're a manifestation of our original design that we've fallen from that's been restored to us. So in, in, in practicing, okay, just helping people to see where they might be out of alignment. Maybe they've believed lies or there's unhealed wounds in their soul, or, you know, we all speak stupid stuff sometimes, you yeah. know? So maybe my thoughts are, my conscious thoughts are creating one thing, but my subconscious, right? Those unhealed places are creating another thing. And that's what the Bible is talking about when it talks about the double-minded man. Mm -hmm. It says, you know, the double-minded man is unstable. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. I was taught that was like, oh, if you're not fully sold out to God or whatever. But really what that is, is somebody that's not in full agreement with themselves. And I think we all have an element of that mm -hmm. where we're all learning to come in full agreement with him and with ourselves. And when we tap into that place of agreement with no, no double-mindedness, miracles flow through us just like they're supposed to all the time, like breathing. Wow. 
That's some good stuff right there. They're yeah. just like breathing. The miracles are supposed to happen. I like how in the Bible, it just like was, they walk by and miracles would happen. Like it just is supposed to be normal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I believe we're, I believe we're in a, in a season as we, as the body continues to grow to maturity, we understand because the process of coming into agreement with him and with ourselves basically is that process. It's being changed from glory to glory. It's being transformed by the renewing of our mind. It's being, you know, it's all those things is really, is really growing up. Mm-hmm. You let's, know, talk Jesus, about, let's talk about, you said growing up. So I'm just thinking like, did you always know these things? I mean, I know this was a book about you learning, but like, did you start out with a, a lot in your foundation? Well, you know, I am really thankful. You know, I grew, I, I was saved young, you know, when I was seven, I got the baptism of the Holy Spirit when I was nine. But then after that, I, my parents sent me to a fundamental Baptist church and school. So it was, you know, it was a mixed bag. It was, you know, having to unlearn some of the legalism and some of those things and redeeming some time because those were years that were away from the Holy Spirit. I mean, he was still, of course, living in me, but I wasn't fully utilizing every, everything that he does, of course. Um, and he's redeemed that time there. I have a cool story about the redeeming of time, um, that really encouraged me. But I, as I look back, I'm really thankful for the foundation that I have in the word, because that's, you know, I look back at my spiritual classrooms and how, how wise the father is, you know, just to lay that foundation in the word and surrender and just understanding, you know, just obedience. And then, you know, a little bit more, you know, baptism, the Holy spirit, and then, you know, inner healing and the prophetic. And it was just like each rung on the ladder was so ordered by him and just how wise and how kind he is in that, Mm. you know, and he's, he's a gentle with it. Usually not always, but usually quite (laughs) gentle with it and kind uh, to give us only what we're ready for. Right. Right. Yeah. I believe that's why Jesus spoke in parables. You know, it wasn't to be secretive, but it was so that if somebody wasn't ready to hear the deeper truths, they, they wouldn't understand it. So they wouldn't be judged as severely. It was a manifestation of the father's kindness. Yeah. It, I think this is true. I think it's also for a treasure hunt. Like as if it, he's like, you know, if you really want to know, you'll spend some time and figure out and learn exactly what I'm talking about. But if you're just going to listen, like you're not, it's, I think most of our walk is a treasure hunt of what else God has for us. It's opening the, the boxes and gifts in ourselves and opening up what he's offering to us, what his word says. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I love that. I love that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So tell me a little bit more about your treasure hunt. How has that been with either uh, after you've written or as you were going along? Well, you know, I've, I've seen some just beautiful, I've seen the Lord do some really amazing amazing things. And, you know, I I was thinking about just the interview today. I'm like, which ones do I share? Because, um, you know, he's just, he's just so amazing and and he's so kind. Um, I'll share first, uh, just about the, what he showed me about the redeeming of time. And then I'll just share, if there's time, I'll share a couple of quick testimonies of people that have kind of walked this out and seen some really cool miracles. But, um, with the redeeming of time, you know, I had lost in my mind, lost those 20 years, you know, just not really engaging with Holy spirit. And so always in my mind was, Oh, you know, what, where would I be now? Had I, you know, gone to X, Y, Z, you know, the spirit filled church school, you know, I'd probably be so far down the trail and all this. And so, you know, you just have those things in the back of your mind and, I don't think we really have a grid carry for how redemptive God's nature is and how everything in his interaction with us is redemptive and how he redeems time in ways that, that we can't even comprehend. And so, but, you know, we think in such this tiny little box. And so that was kind of where my headspace was, is like, oh, that was this, this really bad wrong turn away from Holy Spirit. And what if, what if, you know, all that crazy stuff we think. And so, um, Two years ago, well, my husband and I moved into this um, 
house in a neighborhood that used to be just the happening neighborhood. It's kind of, you know, gone downhill, but it's where we knew we were supposed to be. Um, Holy Spirit met me when I walked through what's now my worship room. I'm like, this is our house. And so uh, we, we moved in this house uh, 12 years ago, about the same time as uh, this couple moved in next door. And they had gained the house and inheritance. Well, long story short, it was a, a drug house uh, for for over 10 years. And um, there were drive-bys and overdoses, um, wep- sale of weapons, prostitutes. It was so bad. And then the house across the street was a friend of ours lived there. It got sold. It was a drug house too. We were surrounded on three sides and it was the side. My, my worship room is a sunroom. It's all glass on that side of the house, you know? And so I was in this one, you know, I, we would, we befriended them and we would just love them. We would not enable, you know, you don't give them money, but you know, we just love them. And, and I always saw just the gold in there, especially in her, but it was just, you know, um, in the last year of, of everything that happened, she overdosed three times and, um, and died and was resuscitated. And so it was just a really bad, bad scene. And I remember this one day I'm in my worship room and I'm like saying, Lord, you know, it was like complaining prayer, you know, that kind of prayer, like, Lord, you said light overtakes darkness. Now what's going, you know, cause it just felt like it was getting worse. Well, long story short that the Lord supernaturally got her out of there the day before the house got raided, everybody, but one girl went to jail and, um, I had been talking to her about going into teen challenge rehab. Uh, it's a year long Christian program. You, you might be familiar with it. Yeah. And, but you know, the year, you know, just sounded like so long to her. And so after this went down, she agreed to go in and that's a whole long, crazy, really funny and beautiful story. And she did go in the program and told me, uh, well, the Lord told us uh, to renovate the house because it was, you can't even imagine how horrible of it being a drug house for 10 years. Everything was broken, bullet holes in the window, roach infested, floor to ceiling with junk. It was like, I can't even describe it. But the Lord said, you need to renovate this, rent it out while she's gone to help pay for her, you know, being in, in, in the program and fill, you know, put people in there that love, fill it with prayer and worship, not just good people, but really, you know, God people. And so that's what we did. I found out after she got in the program that the two things were her hesitation, uh, her two hesitations for going in the program was her significant other, her boyfriend. And he ended up, we helped him get in teen challenge too. And the house, she was worried about the house. So the Lord ministered to both of her concerns without her even ever telling us on the front end. So the redeeming time part has to do with after we renovated this thing and we're, you know, a friend of mine connected me with a missionary couple that needed a short term house while they were a place to live while they were, uh, buying a house. And so really good people love the Lord, love prayer. So we're sitting in my husband and I, and this couple were sitting in the living room, uh, you know, doing the paperwork and just getting to know each other. They, they were from a different state. And when we're, you know, just in the small talk, uh, they told me where they were from, that they were from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, which I'm like, well, that's where I'm from. You know, that's where I grew up. Come to find out they, they went to that church that I had been kicking rocks all this year. Like, what if I would have gone there whatever? And Holy spirit clear as a bell said to me, you've been asking me where you would be. Had you not lost those 20 years? He said, you would be sitting right here right now in this room, having this conversation. (laughs) Wow. So God doesn't miss a thing. He doesn't. And that, you know, that's, really takes the pressure off. And it so shifted my mindset because, you know, we all have realized, wow, that was a wrong turn, you know, wish I had that do over, but we don't fully understand the redemptive nature of God and how time is his servant and how kind and, and how amazing he is. And he showed me, I would have been, I think I took the hard route. You know, I think I took the hard road, but I would have ended up right in the same place because my heart just kept saying yes to him. Mm. And that encouraged me so much. Yeah. I feel like uh, often I talk to people who say that they can look back and see God moving even in their roughest, toughest times and that they wouldn't give it up ever, no matter what the difference would have been because of where God brought them. Well, you know, if we have authority over everything that we overcome, then 
even the hard times, it's, you know, if you gain authority over that thing that you can use to help others, then it's, it's a win-win. Wow. Can you talk a little bit to that, Virginia, that we have authority for the places we've had to walk in this trial? Yeah. Anything that we overcome, we carry authority over. So nothing is, nothing is ever lost. If we just keep saying yes to him, if we just keep allowing our heart to be moldable, nothing is ever lost. And so, you know, you look back, oh, I wish that terrible thing would have never happened. Well, of course, you know, it wasn't that God wanted it to happen either. You know, he didn't do that. You know, that's a result of the fall. We're not created for those things. But again, he's so redemptive that in his hand, when we place those things in his hand, he turns, he, you know, he heals and he restores so completely. And then we carry authority that we can be used to, that that can be used to set the captives free. So Unless we quit or we become bitter and offended, nothing is ever lost ever Amen. in him. Amen. That's who he the, is. <laughs> the Lord is showing me, even today, he was showing me that when we have had victory in one area, it actually gives us space and learning to have victory in another area. And they mm-hmm. could be different, but because we've already walked through victory in one area, we can use that as a foundation. Oh, that's so good. Yeah, Yeah, because we understand how it works exactly, and we have faith that, oh, okay, I I survived that. Then maybe, maybe I'll pop out on the other side of this too. Absolutely. And especially for people that have gone through really big trials that they've overcome really hard things. And if they can just turn to and think of that while they're going to the next thing, like, well, if I was able to do that, then I'll be able to do this. And that's what, you know, in the young man phase of our maturation, it's all about overcoming. And our little body here in Jacksonville, the Lord started speaking to us all about being an overcomer. And, you know, that I remember this one night that my husband was actually speak. He was, he was sharing through the churches in Revelation and he was sharing about to him who overcomes. But the one of the girls on the leadership team didn't know that. And so she shared, she got up and read the scripture that he was getting ready to teach. And another lady had gotten these little stickers that that had a mountain range on it and said overcomer and she bought them for us but the lord had said don't don't give them out yet and then when that happened she ran out to her car and gave them to all of us and um we realized then you can't be an overcomer without overcoming something (laughs) yeah really i mean you have to have something Uh, if we never had anything to to get over we would never understand how good He is. And I think that's kind of maybe where Adam and Eve were. They didn't understand how good he was because everything was just easy street, really, and everything they ever wanted. Yeah. Yeah. So true. So true. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And sometimes we, we don't understand that we too could have everything we want, but it's all in him. Yes. Out of that place of oneness. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. When we learn who our identity is, that we are child of God and have the fullness of the spirit. And really that's what he desires in the kingdom. He's not holding back from us. No, anything. No. So kind. Yeah. He's very good. Hmm. Yeah. Is that what you bring into worship, Virginia? Well, you know, you, we enter his gates with Thanksgiving right into his courts with praise. And so I think there's something when you just exalt his goodness, it's just, it doesn't really get any better than that because it's who he is. Absolutely. Yeah. Now you said you had two stories for us. That was the first one. Oh. Well, yeah, story. I've got a couple stories. I was just thinking of a couple of recent testimonies. And uh, so one is real cool and it kind of, it kind of ties in with the, the premise of the book of coming, coming fully into agreement. So it was a, a lady that I've known for some time had all, I mean, just horrific physical things going on in her body. Now this woman loves the Lord. She's an intercessor, but for over 20 years and accidents, car accidents, and just, I mean, it was just everything you can imagine. And every time I would pray for her, I just really felt that there was um, like a self, an element of self-sabotage, like a self-hatred, you know, just that. I just sensed that. And so we were talking uh, recently and I just, I said, are you sure there was no sexual abuse? And she said, well, actually, 
and Holy Spirit had had already just begun speaking to her about it. And she had minimized it and had said, oh, well, that really wasn't abuse because the perpetrator was a teenager, not an adult. And then because she had turned around later and done the same thing, which is often what we do, right? We, we do what's been done to us or what's been modeled for us. So she minimized it. She locked that away, never told anybody. And of course that prison of shame and all, you know, how that whole thing works. And, and, yeah. and that brings us, it builds a stronghold, right? A barrier. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. The stronghold built of, you know, just the thoughts and the unhealed wounds and the shame and all that stuff. But what was really amazing before we even were able to get together and do like the prayer appointment and, you know, really do that. I mean, I prayed real quick with her on the phone, everything shifted. I mean, it was almost instant and drastic from just saying it to somebody, you know, after all these years and going to all these counseling, it just, I guess it was just time. But what it showed me was there was that little buried area, right? So her conscious mind was like, I want to be healed, right? But that buried place deep in her soul, in her emotional realm was saying, I hate you. You deserve to be punished. Wow, so wait you know, a minute. I mean, that's like some, can you unpack that just for a minute? Because like, that's almost like, is that them that was um, hurting themselves in that? Yeah. You know, you, a lot of times, you know, when you're abused, you, you know, you, you start to hate your body because that's, it represents something dirty, or I don't want to think about that that ever happened, or I hate that that happened to me, or I hate that I did that or whatever. And so it's just that stronghold of shame and condemnation, self-hatred. So again, it's, it's the double mindedness because of course, and if you would have said, do you want to be healed? Well, of course, I don't want to be in this physical pain. You know, every, her whole body was falling apart, but there was a double minded, there was a deeper layer that was creating, right? So our thoughts create, our emotions create, our words create all of those things. And in, in my chapter in the book that talks about emotions, I talk about the conscious, subconscious and unconscious mind. Now I'm not a huge Freud fan. I disagree with a lot of his methodology, obviously, but I do like those terms because to me, it just helped me to understand how all those parts of us fit together and how we can so easily be double-minded right? So God's given us a word. I'm going to heal you. We know Jesus purchased his, you know, the healing for us on the cross. I believe it, all this different stuff, but there's this, it's almost like part of us walking forward and another part of us walking backward. <laughs> We're not going to get very far. And so it was so cool to see just by, you know, when the Bible talks about confess your sins one to another and you'll be healed. I think that was an example of that scripture. It's not talking about sitting with the Pope and the confessional or whatever. That's, that's the counterfeit of, okay, when you can get this out in a safe place and your worst fear is that somebody's going to think, oh, you're an abuser or whatever, you know, whatever is in your head. And somebody is like, oh, this is so awesome that this came out. I'm so happy. And there's no condemnation. That's so freeing. And it helps yeah. that double mindedness go, okay, maybe I don't have to hate me. Yeah. Maybe or I don't deserve it. Even to realize, wow, I hated myself for this. I need to forget. It's almost like we, some people will say, well, I deserve it. It's, it's subconscious though. It's not like you would openly have a dialogue and go up to the bathroom and say, yes, I deserve to be struggling with this thing and I deserve not to be healed. Like they think the conversation wouldn't include that, but the subconscious is the one that's holding on to it as a, uh, I would say a self punishment. I mean, a lot of people talk about when I'm a, I'm a trauma counselor. So when I, when I used to talk to people and they would have trauma then they would usually find some way to harm themselves, whether it was cutting or alcohol and drugs or relationships or whatever it was. And so this sounds like another layer yeah. in the spiritual aspect that we're, people are holding on to uh, almost like deserving of punishment. Mm -hmm. David called it truth in the inward parts, right? So not just our conscious mind, not just what we think we think or we think we feel, but you know, what I always say is where there's fruit, there's a root, right? So if there's fruit in my life of, you know, um, 
it, it, you know, our, our outer world has to be a reflection of our inner world because it's how God created it. It's the spiritual law that mm -hmm. God created, right? So if there's a particular repetitive cycle in my life, you know, I can't change everybody in my world that I've attracted for, you know, <laughs> 30 years, right? I can't make the devil stop being the devil. He's going to always be evil and he's always going to try to destroy me, but I can change me and I can close that open door. So anytime we see a fruit of something in our life, we have to look for a root. And that's not, oh, shame on you. You're a bad person. Try harder, do more. It's wow. Let the, you know, let the Holy Spirit show, show you the truth and let truth be in the deepest places of your soul. Yeah. Then you'll be an unobstructed channel through which all of heaven's resources flow. The right. goodness of God will have nothing like that dam in my soul that was blocking the river of life. There'll be no obstructions in our soul. Yeah. And once we're willing, he's so like, let me take that for you. Mm. Let me, let me get rid of that for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, well, yeah. And he already did. But if we're, if we're not aware that it's even there, then we're not going to appropriate the work of the cross to that area of our life. So we're right. going to be carrying it, not because we have to, but because we haven't proactively appropriated what he's died to give us. I love it. Absolutely. Yeah. So that was, that was one really encouraging story that that shift was so radical and it really just so perfectly displayed the premise of this book of coming into agreement with God and with ourselves with it, which is the hard part and how, when that happens, everything that he wants us to have flows. And it's, it's not this striving, you know, it's not that, I mean, there are times of overcoming and pressing through and doing hard stuff. We know that, but it's not this constant grind. It's not that heavy yoke. It's the light yoke that Jesus spoke of to us. I and he is so gentle. And as I was saying before, to woo us and to let me take that. Let me help you. Let me show you. Are you willing? Are you willing to let me in that space that's tender? Are you willing to let me help you with this process? You know, mm -hmm. and if we are, then he's so willing to come in. Yes. Oh, he's so good. He's so good. The other story is a little more out there. So this one, that one was a little more tame. <laughs> um, but the, the second story that is, is again, these are two recent testimonies. So I'm, I'm in the car driving back with a friend of mine from a women's retreat that we, that I had done in the Carolinas. And, um, she was concerned about a friend of hers that was sick. Um, and this woman had had a stroke and was only, it was, was only able to say like two words and was not doing well at all. And they were um, calling in the family and it was just not a good situation. So she said, well, can we pray for her? And I said, well, yeah, you know, now this, my friend was one that she's, uh, she's read the book and she's been through um, a class, you know, I've taught the, taught the book as a class. So she, you know, she knows this stuff, but again, it's different than how we're used to. It's not what we're, it's not our, our human nature of Adam norm. Right. So we're having to learn to, to, for this to be our norm. So, um, she's like, Oh, I think she said, Oh, I can't wait till I get home so I can go and, you know, lay hands on her. I said, well, why don't we go right now? Why don't we leave our bodies and we go lay hands on her right now? And she's like, okay, you go first. <laughs> I, I'm surprised she wasn't like, what? <laughs> Well, no, because this is, she knows we've been talking about this because basically the last chapter of the book, it's talking about tangible external anchors that help work out what's already done inside our spirits. And that would be one of those things is that we're not created. Our bodies weren't created to be a, a limitation. They were created to be a, a vehicle. And I believe possibly now I, you know, this is, this isn't, I don't have a verse for this. So just you know, take this for what it's worth and bring it to the Lord. But I, I wonder if Adam didn't have his spirit on the outside. And because of that, he was not limited by time or space. Now we're not either because we've been get, given dominion over creation, right? That was the original mandate. Adam lost it. Jesus gave it back to us, which includes time. So, so anyway, I just said, you know, um, well, let's just go pray for her right now. And, and by, again, 
through the imagination gate by faith, led by a force, led by Holy Spirit, not I'm going to do what I'm going to do, <laughs> nothing apart from his lordship, of course, that's understood. So we just, um, you know, through our imagination, we walked in to this woman's room and I saw it, you know, I saw the bed and I saw the people and I described it and she, you know, we were seeing a lot of the same thing. And we just started praying. Well, like we put our spirit hands on her and um, just started speaking. And I didn't know anything about this woman, but I just, I felt the spirit of prophecy just come up and I started prophesying and you're not finished yet. And you have this assignment. I, I don't even remember, you know, when it's flowing out of you, sometimes you don't even remember all of it afterwards. I started prophesying and I found out later that that was, you know, that my friend confirmed that this woman was an intercessor and she was still had some assignments or something. It was, you know, confirmed all that. And, oh, I remember the Lord showed me that and she couldn't talk. She couldn't communicate it. But in her mind, she was dialoguing with the Lord and saying, if this is it, if I'm going to be trapped like this, take me home. And the Lord had us look at her and say, this is not no, you know, the Lord, this is not it. So don't trade with that. You're still, you know, and so had, we were speaking to her as we stood by her bed in our spirits. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, and I really felt Holy spirit on it, got home. She, she was driving. She dropped me off at my house and I was unpacking. And I think I had taken a shower and I was getting ready to go to bed. And I looked at my phone and she had texted me. This woman's best friend had been with her. And at the exact time that we were doing that, this woman just sat up and started talking. And the friend had been the one interacting with, with my friend and basically saying, oh, it's not good or whatever. She's like, I don't know what happened, but she's totally different and blah, blah, blah. And my friend was like, she was just, she was shocked. Because again, it's like, we know this, this is the kind of stuff we see all throughout scripture, right? right. We know this is real. We know it's possible. But we're still surprised when it happens, you know? Right. Because you don't see it on the news at night. They don't, you don't see it in the schoolroom. They don't teach these things anywhere. And usually not even in most churches, they don't teach these things, but it's in the Bible and it is, it does happen. It does happen because miracles are normal. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I'm so glad you wrote that book. Wow. It's been quite a, quite a journey that, that continues. Amen. I pray it does continue with more books. Yes. I've got another book that my next book is called Restoring the Ancient Past. I've already started on it, but it's basically, um, you know, how the, the new age and the occult are walking and all this crazy stuff. Right. And a lot of believers if like what I just said about, well, I left my body and we prayed for this woman. A lot of believers would have been like, oh, that's a cult, right. you know, right. because we've only seen, we've only heard stories about warlocks leaving their body. Nobody talks about this on Sunday morning, but it isn't, it's all through scripture. We have Philip in the Ethiopian eunuch. We, you know, it's all through scripture. If you and, look for it, yes, you'll find it. Exactly. And so this book is basically written for the body of Christ to help people not be afraid and to understand that where there's a counterfeit, there's a real, the real was created by God and the real is better. And you can always find it in scripture. And here's Amen. what, here's what's available to us and that they've just stolen. They've stolen it because we're not walking in it. And when we walk in it, just like light displaces darkness, it's going to shift everything. So that's my next book. And I'm so excited about that. That's I awesome. Need time to write it. I pray you have that time. And you know, it's funny because if there's a counterfeit, it's because there's a real. Mm -hmm. So if Satan is counterfeiting something, if he's doing something and he's getting all this glamour for doing it, well, who's he copying? You know, he can't create anything. Right. You know, only God has created everything. The thief steals, kills and destroys. So all he can do is steal what God has created and pervert it and use it for his own purposes. He can't create anything. Right. So anything that the, the anything that those people are doing for evil look for the real that's in the word and it's far you know it's like um moses and the magicians of pharaoh you know how they did the same things for a while but then there was so many miracles that they they could not do and how daniel and his three friends the bible says were 10 times better than all the magicians in babylon and you've got elijah and the prophets of baal it's all through scripture that we're the head and not the tail but religion has kept us stunted in our growth. And as we 
learn the difference between religion and relationship and take off those grave clothes, we're going to really be the head and not the tail because right. it's, it's right. who we are. yeah, it's who we are. And if fear can lift, if we can not be afraid to try new things and to ask for the Holy spirit and to let him do some wild things, you know, then yes. he will. Right. Yes. Because signs and wonders who follow those who believe and they have since the book was written. <laughs> yes. Greater works. I mean, I just think, I mean, imagine, I can't even imagine. Right. So, so, shouldn't, you so shouldn't we be doing all the things that he, that they did? Like if they already did it in the Bible, we should be like, okay, that's our stepping stone. That's our foundation. We can do that. We know we can do that. We're not really sure the more that we can do, but we, we can do what he said already happened because he said these things and more. Right. Yeah. Yes. Well said. Yeah, that's wow. our that's our foundation. And then there is no limit to there what is. No yeah, limit. he's limitless. Wow. Yeah. Absolutely. And we are too. Crazy enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> we fall into limitation, but we've been freed from that. So right. and we can well, learn more about that as we learn more about who we are in him and who he is in us. Absolutely. Wow. Thank you, Virginia, for showing those stories. Those were awesome. Anything else you'd like to share before we wrap up? I don't think so. I think that that pretty much sums up everything. I just, I love di dialoguing with you. You just awesome. hit all my spirit buttons, Carrie. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, how can people find your button? How can they find you and, and find the book and find their, your music? Where can they find you? Um, my website is virginiakillingsworth.com. And so um, I've got Miracles Are Normal. I've also got, got it translated into Spanish. Um, and the, the Russian translation is almost done. And the audiobook is available. I haven't, I, that just happened. So the audiobook is not up on my website yet. Hopefully that will be in a couple of weeks. But, um, and then I've got a children's book called The Garden in My Heart. And so those are all available on my website as well as on Amazon. And uh, my music is available, um, hard copy and download from my website, as well as, you know, Spotify, Apple Music, iTunes, all of those, all of those things. And I've got a bunch of free stuff on there. I've got free downloads of teachings and free music. And um, I've actually got a nine part teaching a uh, series on YouTube. That's kind of the, the basic idea of the book we were talking about. It's called restoring the ancient paths. Wow. So we've got some little stuff on some music and some stuff on YouTube as well. We'll list that below. So everybody who's watching, you can go down below and we'll, we'll put a link down there for you to get that. Wow. Thank you so much, Virginia, for coming on here. Everybody be blessed. If you're hearing this share, with someone when you were like, what, you know, share with somebody that needs to have that wow moment and uh, comment below, let us know what you're thinking. And hopefully we can get you some answers if you have questions. Have a blessed night.